So Hilda said that this conference is about the extraordinary in the ordinary. And I thought I would pick three ordinary substances and talk about something, things that are very extraordinary about these substances. So the first substance I've picked naturally is milk, <laughs> then blood, and then water. Now, last year, there was an article in The Economist. It was about plant-based diets and plant-based milk, and it had the tagline, technology can help deliver cleaner, greener, delicious food. Whether consumers want it is another question. And of course, our job is to make sure that consumers don't want this crap. But anyway. <laughs> and in, in the article, was, some, was an admittance that I had always suspected, but I'd never read it anywhere, and it was that plant-based milks are more profitable than cow, the cow-based varieties. So the plant-based foods, I mean, right here is the reason that they want you to eat plant-based foods, because they're more profitable. My son, is, one of my boys is a chef. He said, you know, Mom, if you order a steak in a restaurant, 50% of what you pay for that meal is, goes for the ingredients, mostly the steak. If you order a plant-based kind of vegetarian meal, 25% uh, of what you pay for goes to the ingredients. If you order a muffin, it's only 15%. So that's what they want you to eat, muffins. You know. <laughs> so, um, Food scientists, uh, and this is what it said in the article, food scientists base their labors on the assumption that milk is just fat, protein, sugars, mineral, and water. And they don't even mention vitamins, so just fat, protein, sugars, minerals, and water. And so can easily be reproduced in the laboratory from other ingredients, okay? Um, the notable vegetarian Henry Ford said, it is a simple matter to take the same cereals which the cows eat and make them into milk, which is superior to the natural article and much cleaner. Okay. Now this is what Joel, where, are you here, Joel? Okay. Well, this is what Joel would call an example of Western Greco-Roman compartmentalized, fragmented, <laughs> systematized, linear, reductionist, individualized, disconnected, parts-oriented thinking. <laughs> Whew, that's an awful. And I would also add, I could add another word to that, Joel, that you left out. I can't believe you left this word out. Materialistic, okay? These are materialists. They believe that in the beginning was matter, Matter was God, matter was with God, and nothing was made except by matter. I mean, that's what they believe. There's no other dimension, there's no spiritual world, there's no vibrations, there's just matter, okay? Well, let's look at some of these things in milk. Let's start with one of the sugars, a sugar called oligosaccharides. When scientists discovered oligosaccharides in milk, they said, well, nature must have made a mistake. After all, it's all by chance anyway. So, so nature made a mistake, and here are these oligosaccharides in the milk, and human beings can't digest oligosaccharides, so that's a big mistake. Well, it turns out that oligosaccharides are the perfect food for healthy, uh, bacteria in the gut of the infant, and so there's a very good reason for it to be there. But in those days, you know, all bacteria was bad. We've had a complete paradigm shift about bacteria. Also, they found polysaccharides in the milk, and we know that polysaccharides are really hard to break down. But again, they encourage the uh, growth of the good bacteria in the gut. So there's some really extraordinary sugars in this thing we call milk. Well, let's talk about fats in the milk. Now, when they make baby formula, they put vegetable oils in. It's not, they're not really fats, but. Uh, there's a couple of really extraordinary fats 
in human milk. And one of them is called DHA. It's a very complex uh, omega-3 fatty acid that's critical for brain development. And there's another fat in the milk, one that you may not have heard about, called arachidonic acid. Anyone heard about arachidonic acid? Okay. Arachidonic acid is a really critical fat. It's an omega-6 fatty acid. 11% of our brain is arachidonic acid. Uh, it's very important for your digestive tract. Um, we need arachidonic acid for tight cell-to-cell -cell junctures. Where do we need tight cell-to-cell -cell junctures? We need it in our gut and our skin. So the skin's not leaky, the guts are not leaky, and that is arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid is actually kind of shaped like a hairpin. So I always think of these little hairpins <laughs> holding our cells together, but anyway. Guess what? There's only one place we can get arachidonic acid, animal fats. And here we have been uh, avoiding animal fats all these years, and what do we have? An epidemic of gut problems, an epidemic of brain problems, an ep epidemic, oh, so cold I can't pronounce epidemic, but <laughs> <laughs> an epidemic of skin problems, and an epidemic of addictions. Guess what other thing we use arachidonic acid for? We use it to make natural cannabinoids. Same thing that's in marijuana. We make naturally out of this very special fat that's in only in animal fats. So, you know, what my uh, prescription is for addictions, especially addiction to marijuana. Butter, 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 butter. Eat lots of butter. <laughs> okay. Uh, there's also a fat in milk called butyric acid. It's pretty unique to butter fat in milk. And butyric acid is really critical for gut health. And we want, um, in the colon, you want a predominance of butyric acid or things just don't go very right. So. You know, just fats. We just put some vegetable oil, and that's cleaner and greener. But of course, you're not getting these really critical fats that make our brains work, our guts work, and make us happy. Make us happy. Cholesterol. Now, you know, cholesterol is the biggest mistake that we find in nature. Cholesterol is going to kill you. It's going to give you heart disease. But it turns out that cholesterol is really, really high in milk, especially mother's milk. And not only that, there are special enzymes that ensure that 100% of that cholesterol is absorbed. But uh, just a mistake, right? That's a mistake that nature made. So, um, uh, I, Joel, you probably never bought milk replacement for your animals. And I haven't either. But I was in a feed store, and I thought, I'm going to look at the label on this milk replacer. It's for calves. And the first ingredient was powdered skim milk. I forget what the second one was. Um, probably sugar. But the third one, I kid you not, is on the label. It said animal fat. It's the third ingredient in milk replacer for calves. There is no animal fat in human formula. You look at the label. It's powdered skim milk, so the animal fat taken out, some kind of carbohydrate, usually sugar or high fructose corn syrup, and then vegetable oils. Because nature is certainly, there's some kind of mistake that cholesterol is in milk, you know. I mean, no wonder we have this incredible health crisis when People just think that milk is just a collection of sugars, fats, and proteins, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Proteins, okay. The proteins in milk are different from the proteins in meat. The proteins in meat are very tightly wound up, and it actually improves their um, assimilation if you cook the proteins in meat. They unwind a little bit, the digestive enzymes can t attach on, and digest those proteins. But the proteins in milk are very fragile, three-dimensional 
elegant. They look like these little ribbons. And every point on the protein has a different charge, supposed to be negative or positive, in just that exact place. They're uh, extremely fragile. And these proteins not only give us protein like casein, uh, they are important enzymes. Two of them, uh, lactoperoxidase and lactoferrin, are antimicrobial and make sure that we're protected from uh, so-called bad guys. Also, uh, these proteins are enzymes. And every single vitamin and mineral in milk has a special protein, a special enzyme, that attaches to that nutrient and makes sure it's 100% absorbed. There's no other food like this on the whole planet where you absorb 100%. In fact, when they measure uh, vitamin and mineral levels in milk, they say, well, they're, they're kind of low, actually. But what they're not taking into account is that they're 100% absorbed. So they can be lower than what's in the other foods. Lots of other wonderful things in milk. There's something called mucins. And these uh, kind of go out and they're sticky. And they attach to bacteria and viruses. And they prevent them from attaching to the mucosa. Um, and then pr uh, prevent them from being absorbed. Uh, mucins, actually, their capability is to form gels. And they serve as barriers to bad things getting in and, and so forth. Uh, something called fibronectin. Anybody ever heard of fibronectin? No, OK. So this is increases the antimicrobial activities. And it also is like a kind of Band-Aid. It goes around and um, patches up damage in the gut. And then there's a really long word here, glycomacropeptides. So another one of these simple things in milk supports the good growth of good bacteria and really supportive of the immune system. So I would say that um, so far it's not just plain old proteins, fats, and carbohydrates, is it? Then we have, and we're going to talk about blood in a minute, but uh, every single thing that you find in blood, except for red blood cells, is in milk. Leukocytes, lymphocytes, all these long words, neutrophils, immunoglobulins, antibodies, they're all in milk. And they build the immune system of the infant, or they support your own immune system if you're an adult. Uh, uh, milk was actually used for transfusions in World War I when they didn't have milk banks, or blood banks, excuse me. They had raw milk, and they used it very successfully for transfusions. So uh, milk is uh, um, rightly called white blood. Now, all of these components, even the sugars, are warped, distorted, destroyed by this thing we call pasteurization, by heating the milk, so-called to get rid of uh, bad germs. And this is a perfect example of what I was saying earlier, or what Joel always says. It's an example of Western Greco-Roman compartmentalized fragments. It's <laughs> you know, parts-oriented thinking. <laughs> That's what pasteurization is. It takes nature's most fragile, uh, integrated, and delicate food and treats it as an industrial product and thinks, well, we can just smash it and heat it. You know, most milk today is ultra pasteurized. It's rushed past a superheated stainless steel plate and heated to 230 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, you can't do that in your kitchen. If you boil milk, it only gets to 212. So you have to have a real industrial process to get liquid milk to that temperature. Why do we really pasteurize? The re real reason we pasteurize is for convenience. The first pasteurization laws were passed in 1913 in New York, compulsory pasteurization. 
The committee that passed this uh, law knew that raw milk was healthier. They knew that raw milk could be produced in a healthy way, safe, healthy way. But they said, uh, we don't have the funds, the money, to go out and, in, and um, you know, inspect all these little farms. And if we had pasteurization, uh, we would uh, impose a lot of this inspection on the milk companies. And it would just be a lot easier for us if we didn't have to inspect raw milk. And you know, the first inspector that we had at uh, our farm in Southern Maryland when we started, we were making cheese, but of course I wanted to do raw milk. And the inspector said, Sally, you know, we just don't have the manpower to inspect all these little farms. It's the same reason, you know? Just the laziness of bureaucrats. They don't, they don't wanna do the work of inspecting a lot of small farms. So, um, what happens to all of these vitamins and minerals when we pasteurize? They are not assimilated as well. They're not absorbed as well. Animal studies, there were some animal studies done. You can't do the animal studies today or you'd lose your funding, but um, uh, on milk, I mean. Uh, better calcium assimilation. Animals on raw milk had longer bones, a uh, lot more dense density in the bones. Better iron assimilation, animals on pasteurized milk became anemic, even though there's iron in the milk because they could not assimilate it. Uh, better B12 assimilation and the riboflavin was completely destroyed by pasteurization. I loved Joel's talk last time about trying to find out why his chickens had these tendon problems and their feet turned over and he read all the animal books and he finally found one that said it was a riboflavin deficiency. And um, so your kids are having rheumatoid arthritis, uh, tendon problems, uh, they cry because their joints hurt, their tendons hurt. Uh, that's the riboflavin. And that's completely destroyed by pasteurization. In 1943, uh, a, a doctor, and this is a man doctor, his name is Evelyn, but it was the man's name. Uh, the London Hospital wrote, in certain institutions, children who were brought up on raw milk had perfect teeth and no decay. The result is so striking and unusual that it will undoubtedly be made the subject of a further inquiry. In 1943, have we had further inquiry? <laughs> what happened was that in 1945, something called Coronet Magazine published an article about a town called Crossroads, USA, where they had an outbreak of undulant fever that killed a third of the townspeople. And this article was repeated in the Reader's Digest the next year, 1946. There's one little problem. <laughs> There's no town of Crossroads. It never existed. They just made it up. They just made up the outbreak of undulant fever. They just lied about this. And so this was the basis for mandatory pasteurization that came a couple years later. Now, people say, well, all this stuff about raw milk is old, old studies, back in the 40s and the 30s. Well, there's a new study, 2019, came out of China. And they looked at the effect of processing on milk proteins. Uh, they did four things to the milk. One is they boiled it, presumably to imitate pasteurization. They did spray drying, which is very high temperature. They did freeze drying, and they did microwaving. Okay? All four methods resulted in significant degradation and oxidation of the milk proteins, including freeze drying. Uh, pretty shocking, actually. When fed to rats, the processed milk proteins cause damage in the plasma, liver, and the brain, and adversely affected learning and memory in rats. Okay? That's what we're doing to all of our milk. And where are we seeing the worst effects of this, but in the learning ability of our children? And then we have this idea of turning the cow into a unit of production, an industrial animal. 
and feeding this cow any old thing instead of what the cow was designed to do. You know, the cow has four stomachs and is the animal that is most exquisitely designed to eat grass. We're feeding our cows anything but grass. We feed them uh, soybeans, which, and by the way, we all know that milk reflects the diet of the mother or the animal. So the allergenic soy proteins, the estrogenic isoflavins, the glyphosate, all comes through in the milk. We feed bakery waste to our cows, old donuts and potato chips. All of those rancid fats come through. One of the worst things we're giving our cows is citrus peel cake. Uh, this is the waste product of the uh, orange juice industry. And citrus has some of the worst pesticides on it that have ever been invented. Cholinesterase inhibitors, which act as nerve poisons. In fact, the one processed food that is most associated with Alzheimer's in a very good study was fruit juice. And that would be mostly orange juice. And of course, hormones and antibiotics. And <laughs> between the paper sticking together and then the wind. Now we are building dairy farms next to the ethanol plants and feeding our cows swill from ethanol production. So, so pasteurization is what I call a good example of the uh, Marxism that has infiltrated uh, the practice of agriculture in this country. You know, Karl Marx preached the industrialization of agriculture and animals as units of production. And what pasteurization has done in this country has accomplished the Marxist dream of getting rid of small farms because the centerpiece of rural life in America for decades, for centuries, uh, yeah, was the, the dairy farm, the small family dairy farm. And of course, you know, the Marxists hate small farmers and has various ways of getting rid of them. One is to just kill them. Uh, one is to starve them. One is to expropriate their property. Or finally, they can just implement mandatory pasteurization. That takes longer. But um, <laughs> dairy farms are, well, I say that takes longer because um, and it starts with this attitude that milk is just a collection of fats, carbohydrates, and proteins. Dairy farms in this country go out of business at the rate of 16 per day. California lost 600 dairy farms in 10 years. The only dairy farms making a profit in California today are the raw milk dairy farms. Uh, Maryland, state of Maryland, had 1,900 dairy farms in 1990. Today, there are less than 400. So uh, I think we can see what compulsory pasteurization laws have done. They are largely responsible for uh, the decline of American small towns and rural life. And what pasteurization does is transform what should be a local value-added product into a commodity product. All because we do not see the extraordinary in the ordinary glass of, raw, of milk. Well, the good news is that raw milk today is the fastest growing agricultural product. It's now available in 44 states. And uh, yeah, it's coming. We were able to uh, use a little loophole in the state of Maryland. We got a permit to um, sell raw milk as pet milk. I noticed that they had um, raw frozen goat milk in the, in the health food store, and it came from Pennsylvania. Oh, lovely. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> and um, I was able to get a meeting with some people in the governor's office, and I just kind of slammed this carton down on the big mahogany desk. And I said, I said, look at this. This is raw milk. It's being sold in 
Maryland. It's completely legal and it's coming from a farm in Pennsylvania and I'm a farmer in Maryland and I want to do this and you can't say no to me. If you, if you allow this from a Pennsylvania farm. You... Anyway, there's now about uh, three dozen uh, pet milk permits in the state of Maryland, so that's really good. I'll tell you something really neat. I, I'm a big advocate of the English measuring system. I think it's actually a human-based and actually a God-based measuring system as opposed to the decimal system. One gallon of milk makes one pound of cheese. Isn't that neat? Yeah. A thousand pounds of milk is 120 gallons, and that fulfills the, um, the sacred ratio of five to six. So. All right, let's turn to blood. <laughs> These papers are damp and sticky. And <laughs> okay, so blood, I think uh, we can all agree that there's some really extraordinary things about blood. It carries oxygen to all our cells, but also all the nutrients, all the hormones, all the signaling compounds, all the exosomes. It's a highway of communication and delivery, and it's also the garbage collector, takes the waste away. So this is, blood is a pretty amazing substance. It's a lot like milk in that it is a liquid in which solids are dissolved, and the solids in blood are red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. So it's sort of like the curds and whey of milk. We have the solids and the plasma of blood. Uh, red blood cells carry, uh, contain hemoglobin, it's an iron-based uh, chemical, and uh, it's a very good stainer. That's why the Native Americans use blood for paint, beautiful red color. Uh, so let me ask you this question, why are barns red? Because when they built a barn, they wanted to protect it. They, used, they didn't have paint in the old days. Uh, they put linseed oil on it, but they also wanted to know when the linseed oil was fading away, so they mixed it with ox blood. And the beautiful color of red barns is the color of blood. Yeah. Uh, now, red is not the only possible blood color. Oh, just going back to hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is iron-based, and blood has magnetic properties. This is the basis of the MRI, magnetic resonance. And it's, to me, this is the scientific explanation for the fact that some people are very sensitive, some people are healers, it's because they are very attuned to those magnetic properties in the blood. Now, red isn't the only possible color of blood. Some animals have green, blue, or even purple colored blood due to the different oxygen carrying proteins. For example, shellfish have blue blood. They don't have iron in their blood, they have copper, and that makes it blue. And I, my colleague Tom Cowan likes to point out the, the Botticelli painting of Venus in the clamshell. And of course, Venus represents uh, the planet Venus, of course, and it's associated with copper. And that's why she's standing in the clamshell, <laughs> because the clams have copper in their blood. OK, so unlike red blood cells, uh, the white blood cells in our blood form the defensive system of the body. And as I said, they're exactly the same as what's in milk. Uh, they are responsible for getting rid of toxins, foreign proteins, et cetera. They fight cancer and other unwanted uh, material in the human body. Uh, we have a kind of pejorative word for dead white blood cells. We call them pus, okay? Uh, the third type of component in blood is the platelets. These are completely different and are responsible for blood clotting. Whenever bleeding occurs, they come and help uh, heal the wound and prevent the unwanted loss of blood. So some really amazing substances. I mean, how do they even know we've cut ourselves? But they scurry along and get to the right place and help the blood clot. Okay. Did you know that our blood contains gold? Our bodies contain about 
0.2 milligrams of gold, and most of this is in the blood. There's only one place where there is no blood in our body. It's the cornea of the eye. And that's because the cornea is capable of directly extracting oxygen from the air. Amazing. Now, the adult body has about 60,000 miles of blood vessels running throughout the body. If they were put end to end, uh, all the blood vessels in the human body, they would wrap around the earth two and a half times. That's how many blood vessels we have in our body. A quarter of all the cells in our body are red blood cells. So the total number of red blood cells in the adult human body at any given time is from 20 to 30 trillion red blood cells. Uh, the, the total number of white blood cells in the body is between 4,000 and 11,000. So we really have a lot of red blood cells. Now, the red blood cells don't reproduce themselves. They don't have a nucleus. And they don't live for more than 120 days. And these uh, red blood cells are, um, so they, they, they die. And then they're replaced by new red blood cells, which are mostly produced in the bone marrow. So every nearly, so nearly 2 million red blood cells in the adult human body die every month, week, hour, no, every second. Two million bl red blood cells die every second, and they are replaced. Two million blood cells are replaced every second. Okay, another thing about the blood is that the blood pumps the heart. The heart does not pump the blood. And when you think about it, it's, it's pretty obvious. I mean, the blood, the heart beats, okay? But the blood coming into the heart is going just as fast as the blood going out of the heart. So the blood is not, the heart is not pumping the blood. The blood goes into the heart, it fills a chamber, then it flows into another chamber. That's what causes the beating of the heart. And as Tom likes to point out, while it's in the heart, the heart listens to the blood and picks up the hormones, the, the features, the, the communication from the blood. So when the blood leaves the heart, it goes, it slows down, goes down to all the capillaries where it actually kind of stops, does this. Not, it's not because it's cold, but it does this. <laughs> and then it goes through one blood cell at a time through the capillaries very slowly. <clears throat> and then it goes back to the heart and it gets faster and faster and faster. And that's because of the, um, the charge of the endothelium of the capillaries and the blood cells, uh, blood vessels, um, have the same charge as the blood cell, and they push the blood back to the heart. So, so we all know about blood types. There are four blood type, main blood types: A, B, AB, and O. This is part of a simple, simplified system. There are actually about 30 different recognized types of blood. But um, the Japanese are really into blood types. And they think that a person's personality is determined by their blood type. So there's two main blood types. Type O are extroverts, gregarious, outgoing. So Hilda and Joel, you know, they'd be type O people. And type A people are more introverted, more quiet. They're good accountants or good at filing and stuff. <laughs> so Kathy and I are the type A's in this organization. But the Japanese are really into blood types. Uh, you can, when you set up your Facebook page, there's a drop down where you can put your blood type on your Japanese Facebook page. <laughs> and um, products like books and drinks are uh, geared to your blood type, even condoms. <laughs> And it's the blood type of your partner, not of you. So you have to find out what her blood type is anyway. <laughs> so we're not so into blood types as they are. All right. But uh, even though the typos get all the attention and everything, uh, typo is the uh, preference for mosquitoes. They really like typo blood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. 
All right, let's move on to water. The extraordinary in the ordinary. So we are the watery planet. As far as we know, there's no other planet with so much water on it, certainly not on the surface. Water is soft and yielding, but also strong and destructive. It's the only substance on the planet that expands when it's frozen. And this uh, property has been used for millennia to quarry stone. You make a little crack in the stone, you pour water in there. When it freezes in the winter, a whole slab will come off. That's how strong frozen water can be. Water can generate enormous pressure. At the moment of germination of a seed, the water can generate a pressure of 400 atmospheres. And this is why plant shoots can break through asphalt. Water has the highest surface tension of all liquids, and yet it is the universal solvent. Uh, it can rise in trees dozens of feet tall, a sap, it's all the way to the top, so it's anti-gravity. Uh, without these unique properties, life on Earth could not exist. And we have known these things about water for, for a long time. Uh, but we are now discovering new properties of water. And one of the most amazing things about water is that it has memory and makes an imprint of every outside occurrence. Water structures itself in little clusters, which act as memory cells. And these memory cells have 440,000 information panels within each one. And of course, there are gazillions of them just in a drop of water. So water changes when we turn on a light, when it's subject to power lines or EMF. Uh, it remembers everything. It is a malleable computer. And everything that's ever happened can be imprinted on the water, and the water remembers. Let's see. So, yes, as the water records information, it acquires new properties, yet the chemical composition is unchanged. So it's just, water is a tremendous uh, memory computer. And a couple example of examples of this, um, this comes from a really interesting uh, movie about water I saw on the internet. In 1947, some scientists were gathered together and they were um, at a meeting. They had a pitcher of water on the table and they were discussing how to make weapons of mass destruction to kill and uh, torture most of humanity. And they all drank from the water and they were poisoned by the water. The water picked up what they were talking about. In 1881, there was a fire on a ship and the men had to get in a lifeboat and they quickly ran out of water. And yet, when the, finally they were rescued three weeks later, uh, they were all fine. And that's because they decided to pray and imagine that they had fresh water. And the next day, the captain thought, well, he was just so thirsty, he didn't care whether he drank salt water and he tasted it and the water all around the, the boat was fresh. So positive and negative human emotions can affect water, obviously. Love increases the energy levels in water, and aggressive emotions decrease the energy levels in water. Uh, this has great consequences for food preparation. Okay? The uh, emotion the attitude of the cook affects what goes into the food and affects how it nourishes you. But today, most people are eating foods that's made by machines. So I'm sure many of you heard, have heard of Dr. Masuro Emoto from Japan. And I love his name, Dr. Emoto, like emotions. And he's done various experiments subjecting water to various influences and then freezing it in the little Petri dishes and seeing what kind of pattern the water makes after it's frozen. If you subject water to a microwave oven or a mobile telephone, the, when you freeze the water, there's a dark hole in the pattern that's left. 
If you thank the water, if you think wisdom or love, the water makes beautiful six-sided crystals. If you say to the water, you disgust me, and freeze the water, it, uh, it um, coalesces into a chaotic pattern. If you uh, water seeds with structured water, um, it actually will give off more, they'll give off more pr um, photons. You can measure this with Carillion photography. The fruit ripens faster and less water is needed. Now in nature, water flows in a curving course, but most of us get our water coming through pipes, going through right angles. Very, water doesn't like straight lines, you know and uh, each right angle uh, turn breaks down the structure of water. We pollute water with stress, anxiety, and negative emotions. Now, this is really significant because every li living creature, including human beings, is a container of water. We're all 70 to 90% water. So, as you can imagine, how we think and uh, feel and treat each other uh, affects the water and affects our own health. And this discovery of water having memory gives us a new and scientific explanation for creation. We can see that the images of every existing organism can be present in the water. Every animal and plant that God has imagined or thought of, that thought is in that big malleable computer in the water and just needs an impulse. Uh, water creates the structure of proteins. I mean, the science of proteins is really fascinating how the water almost tells the proteins how to come together, how to be formed. Water creates the structure of DNA, and every species strives to achieve its own perfection. And of course, man, as the wise steward on a farm like this, is helping every species, including the grass, the salamanders, the birds, achieve uh, full perfection. Fascinating study of fish in a tank of water and the water was subject, subjected to a very weak magnetic field. And the offspring of these fish looked completely different from their parents. They had stripes and spots that were not present on the parent fish. So they changed the phenotype of the fish by changing the water. Okay? They didn't change the genotype, they were still fish. But they were able to change the phenotype by changing the water. Nuclear radiation changes the structure of water, creates a new and pathological ordering, and the new thinking about nu uh, radiation from nuclear bombs is that the real destruction comes from the change in the water. And of course, the brain is made of water just like every other part of us, so we'll change the, that structure. The Dead Sea is the only body of water on Earth where nothing will grow, not even algae. And the question we have to ask, is this the result of what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah? There was some kind of nuclear event there, and the Dead Sea is completely dead. <clears throat> if you say thank you to water, the quality will improve. So when the water comes out of the pipes, going through all those right angles, we say thank you, we bless the water. Uh, that should help it a lot. Water remembers the place where we were born. It gives us a connection to our birthplace, and this is where we get the concept of homeland. Nowhere on earth is water the same, so we all have a connection to the place we were, where we were born. If you drink bad, dead water, and, the, and you look at your blood in dark field mi microscopy, uh, it will be a lot of rouleau. If you drink structured water, that rouleau disappears and the blood cells um, become separate. You can see how important it is to eat food in a good mood. Um, you shouldn't ever eat with cruel or destructive people. Don't share meals with these people. 
<clears throat> and this brings me to a subject of dear to my heart, music. The kind of music we listen to is extremely important. And Dr. Emoto's research showed that classical music makes beautiful crystals in frozen water. Heavy rock freezes into chaotic residues. Learn to listen to beautiful classical music, please. Dr. Emoto performed an experiment with rice in three beakers with water added. Uh, to one beaker, he said, thank you and the rice after three or four weeks fermented. To the second beaker, he said, you are an idiot, <laughs> and the rice turned black. The third beaker was ignored, and the rice rotted. So again, this shows how important it is when we're preparing food, uh, our attitude to the food. Also shows how important it is uh, the way we treat children as they're growing, because your attitude, if you say you are an idiot, that's imprinted in the memory of the child. So sending negative thoughts uh, pollutes our own, uh, our own cells as well. Um, a wonderful example in this movie of resonance, this is something that we talked about in our book, The Contagion Myth. If you take two beakers of water, same water, and subject one to an influence, such as a magnetic field or some kind of structuring, the other beaker, if it's not too far away, will take on the same properties as the one that you've subjected to an in, uh, some kind of influence. It helps explain remote communication. Uh, we have information transfer in these liquids. And every cell of yours is a beaker of water. So there is communication between the cells in your body and between the cells of other people. Uh, the good news is that water self-cleans when it evaporates or freezes and melts, and the salinity of ocean water can erase the bad memories in water. So it cleans all that informational dirt. Dr. Yamoto found that the best crystals he got for water were not from one word, but from two words. And those two words were love and gratitude. Now something else we've learned about water recently is that water has four phases. Not just gas, liquid, and solid, but also a gel phase. Against a hydrophilic surface, water separates into an exclusion zone, which we call an easy zone, of structured water with a negative charge and another zone of positive charge. And that exclusion zone is, is like a gel. It's, it's sort of frozen, but it's still soft. And in our cells, that zone of negative charge is, acts as a wire for communication. Exposure to a router overnight reduces that exclusion zone by 15% why you don't want a lot of Wi-Fi going on in your house, especially where you sleep. So we've got this extreme materialistic view, which has kind of been revealed in the last few years. Uh, these people want to get rid of the human being with free will and create what they call designer babies, designer human beings through genetic engineering and thought control. I'm almost done, Joel. <laughs> uh, this is their view of eugenics, that we are going to make better people through genetic engineering and all kinds of science stuff. Uh, these are really very silly people who are talking about this stuff. They're, I feel sorry for them. They're just so imprisoned by uh, their thoughts and their attitudes. What, we, what do we really know about the cells in our body? From the light microscope, there's only a few things we can see in our cells. One is the membrane, uh, the wall, like a citadel, a wall. Then in the middle you have the nucleus where supposedly there's genetic material, although I recently learned that this is just a hypothesis. We've never seen DNA. It's, it's too small to see. You see a few black spots, that's the mitochondria. 
And all the rest of our cells is structured water that can be imprinted with our thoughts, our emotions, and our intentions. And this water, like a computer, has been pre-programmed by God. The Spirit of God moves on the face of the waters, and that is the water in our cells. But then we, we put the data in, okay? So God's the programmer, we're the data entry people. And <laughs> so uh, building a meaningful life for ourselves and building a be better world for everyone else combines the effects of the pre-programming and our own data input. It's a joint effort between God and ourselves, okay? We're, we're partners in this, uh, these endeavors. Um, we were talking about this last time we met with Joel. When you come to a situation, a bad situation, what do you do? Do you pray about it or do you just forget about God and do what you can? And Edgar Cayce said, you pray as if it were entirely up to God and you act as if it was entirely up to you. Okay. It's a joint effort. By the way, uh, Edgar Cayce did talk about eugenics. It was a very big topic in his day and Weston Price's day. And he said the true eugenics occurs when a child is conceived by a loving couple. And now we have the explanation for this. This is explained with the properties of water. Okay? And the fetus grows in embryonic fluid, is surrounded by water, and these influences um, the influences on the water, our thoughts, our emotions, the loving couple, uh, influence the fetus. So we're in charge in that, in that respect. And we would add, of course, that the true eugenics nourishes this child from before conception all through the growing years with nutrient-dense food, real food with structured water, not processed food with dead and chaotic water. So I just want to end by saying that I feel that we're on the cusp here. For years, what we've called science has certainly uh, created a better life, a life free of drudgery, um, a life, you know, it's only through science and modern inventions like plastic piping and you know, all these wonderful things that we can actually farm in this way that honors nature. Uh, but science has also um, kind of taken people away from God and uh, just looked at everything as just sort of ordinary. But new inventions, new discoveries are showing us the extraordinary in the ordinary in milk, blood, and water. And these new discoveries are, create a kind of awe, a, a kind of, you know, oh my goodness, this is, this is fantastic, right? And science now, I believe, is going to lead us back to God and back to a true understanding of our place in the universe and a blueprint for creating a better world. So thank you very much. The extraordinary and the ordinary.